Um, as always, we're just going to go through uh, the Bible, as it turns out. And we're in the middle of 2 Peter. And one of the things we decided that we were going to do at LifePoint, um, while I know a lot of you want to hear my opinions on many things, and I'm sure that's why you show up, whatever. Um, we decided we were going to just go through scripture and, and teach that way. And so one of the interesting things about it is, as we go through scripture, I have to follow the text, right? So this one's a little different today. It's not strange. It's just a little, a little different. And so let's just hop right into it. About 26 years ago, I was sitting in a barber shop in Lebanon. You guys remember, is Raleigh's still over there? Is Raleigh's Barbershop still a thing? But I was sitting there, and I was getting my hair cut by the OG, by Raleigh, right? Raleigh's cutting my hair, and I hear a guy next to me, uh, and they're talking, as is the want at barbershops, about politics and religion. Um, and so then I hear the guy next to me say, well, you know, you can't trust the Bible because it was written hundreds and hundreds of years after Jesus anyway. So I thought it was, um, he would appreciate it if I corrected him on this. I know that most people in my life appreciate knowing the truth. And so I corrected him and I said, well, actually, the last book of the New Testament was the book of John. It was completed uh, no more than 60 years after Jesus. And he accepted that very well. In fact, I believe he probably went home and became a missionary that night. That's what I, that's what I believe. Um, as it turns out, he actually, he, he didn't. Uh, he argued with me. And if those of you who uh, know me now know I'm not above a good argument, but you should have seen me. Some of you know me from 26 years ago. We, we lit that joint up, right? So we had a conversation about it. But the truth is, he wasn't arguing with me. And I mean that, although I was the one who was arguing with him, he was actually arguing with thousands of scholars, believers and unbelievers alike, who date the book of John no later, no later than 100 AD. And, and he's saying that it happened hundreds, at least 200 years after Jesus. And so why was he arguing? Why was he arguing with me? Why was he arguing with the facts, the truth? Because he had heard it repeated. This guy had heard it repeated time and time again that, well, the Bible's written hundreds of years after Jesus, so you can't accept it. Nobody knew what they were talking about. There's all kinds of mistakes in there because it, it was so far after that. But he was also quite obviously, he was obviously an unbeliever. And I could tell he was an unbeliever because the way he approached just the mere fact of the gospel. That I would probably misrepresented grace that day. I didn't give a lot of it. Uh, but he absolutely was a scoffer. He was determined that he wasn't going to accept this truth. And so it's no surprise to me that he repeated lies he had heard. Why? Because he wanted them to be true, didn't he? See, he wanted, and we, we need to understand this about you and here today, perhaps, or an unbeliever, that they want, we want it to be true. Andy Stanley uh, famously made this point, and I wish I would have come up with it, but I didn't. He said, for those of you who say, I'm just on a truth quest. No, you're not. Stop it. Oh, I'm just on a truth quest. I'm just going to follow the facts and, and do this. That is really not our default. Andy Stanley said that really our own default is not to be on a truth quest. Our default is to be on a happiness quest. And we want to find the, the facts that support what I want. And so if you're in here today and you don't want to believe that Jesus was real, you will find facts that are lies. You'll find information and opinions and narratives to support your opinion. So it's no surprise to me that this guy was obviously an unbeliever while he was repeating lies that he had heard. I don't mean lies from the believers. I mean thousands upon thousands of scholars throughout the years dating the book of John no later than 100 A. AD. And yet he had heard different, so he repeated it. No surprise. But you know what is a surprise to me? Is that most believers hear the same lies and don't even know the truth. Bible illiteracy in the Western world is rampant. 
It is absolutely, you talk about epidemics. Bible illiteracy is rampant. Not just knowing what's in the scripture as a believer, but even knowing the context of scripture. And when you do that, you open yourself up to believe in the same lies this guy heard because you hear the same whispers of the world coming at you. And what happens is, when you do this, you become defensive. I see believers all the time. Somebody questions their faith and they get defensive. They say things like, well, how are you? How can you even prove this? How do you know that? And believers, they get defensive. And I always, and again, I do not mean to offend anybody, but I don't care if I do either, if that makes sense. When we're talking about the truth, I, I shouldn't say I don't care. I'm trying to take that on the lexicon. It is, no, I don't care. Um, <laughs> I don't, on this issue, on this issue, which, which is this. I find too many believers who don't know anything else to support their faith who just say this as some last resort. Well, it's just what I believe, okay? Just what I believe. And I hear that and I'm thinking that is so, as if belief alone makes something true. And when we as believers fall back, and again, am I, am I bad-mouthing having faith? No, I cannot argue with the voices in your head today if you're hearing something I did not say. I am simply saying, can we agree that belief alone does not make something true? Amen. So when we tell the unbelieving world, I just believe it, we claimed no amount of truth beyond what they claim to believe. You believe, I believe, you do you, I'll do me, and we backtrack into this thing, which is not true. Sincerity does not validate belief either. You can sincerely be wrong, can you not? We talked about this at Life Group. You can sincerely be wrong, and I won't go into all the examples that history attests to. All you need to go to is your own personal history to know that you can sincerely be wrong because it's just plain, I know, a couple times in, in church, I've had uh, mothers and grandmothers say, we don't say those words in our house. It's not your house. It is stupid to believe that because you believe something strongly enough, it becomes true. Or that if you have a sincere enough belief that it becomes real, it is absolutely plain stupid. You can be sincerely wrong. Can we not? You can be sincerely wrong. And our faith is more than just our belief. Because our faith is based on historical facts. Our faith, the Christian faith, is based on historical events. So much so, and I want you guys to hear this, because some of you don't understand this, but you need to. It is so freeing. There is so much historical evidence that the Christian faith is based on real events that the burden of proof is not upon us who believe. It is upon those who do not believe to prove it is not real. And yet that's not how we approach our faith. We approach it weak-kneed and sappy-minded, assuming that somehow my belief is enough. Well, I'm not questioning your belief nor your faith. But I can tell you that is not the entire basis of our faith. It is based on historical events. Even the most basic question, I've heard this. I've heard this one. Does Jesus even exist? Did he even exist? Is there any proof for that? And I have heard unbelievers say such a thing to believers, and the believers in the room end up saying, well, it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible, so that's how I know Jesus existed. Believers saying that, that you just have to believe the Bible to believe Jesus was real. But I'm here to tell you, that is not true. Amen. It is not true because... The original followers who were spreading the gospel, they believed it because they had seen it. And they claimed to have seen it. And they made the case that you can believe me, not because I have an ethereal belief in something that must make it true, but I believe it because I saw it. And one of those was the Apostle Peter. And I don't have time to go into all of the things about the Apostle Peter. Suffice it to say, he had been with Jesus. He was one of Jesus' inner circle. One of the three, Peter, James, and John, that when Jesus would go do something, he would call them of the twelve along with him. And in 68 AD, Peter is imprisoned in Rome under King Nero. We say this every week. A great fire broke, broke out. History knows this. A great fire broke out in 64 AD. 70% of the infrastructure of Rome, due to Nero's poor policies, burned down. In fact, many people in history, we don't know, but some people claim that Nero himself set the blaze so he could rebuild the way he wanted to rebuild. 
50% of the population was displaced. People wanted a scapegoat. They were coming after Nero. So Nero found an easy target in the Christians. And this is the first persecution that we think of when we think of persecution as if it lasted uh, forever without recess, without doubt, or excuse me, without any uh, cessation of duration throughout all of history. No, there were time periods when it hit, this is the first. When Emperor Nero rounded up believers all throughout Rome and did such things as dip them in oil and tie them on posts and lighting his garden as he lit them ablaze. This is the time the animals being sown onto children and, and thrown in. This is the first time we see this and Peter's been rounded up and so has Paul by the way. Paul, the Apostle Paul is in prison in Rome at the same time. Emperor Nero is holding them to be executed. So while Peter is in prison and we've said this because it's historical in prison. The way that you would survive would be your family and friends. Still many places of the world do this. They would have to come in and give you the things you needed for sustenance. And word reaches Peter that there are people out there, false teachers, who have come up. And this is important. Important. I've never said it that way. I think I'll do it here or not. I like that. This is important to know. They were rising up from within the church. And we have said in here time and time again that when we go to apply the test of Scripture, we must apply it most passionately, not to those who speak bitterness against us, but to those who speak sweetly from within our church. Those who look like us, guys like me, I have said time and time again, you are a fool if you bet your eternal life, the conditions of your family's eternal life, and eternity has started this side of the veil. If you base all that on what Donald Knight says, you're an idiot. Even I don't do that. False teachers were rising up. And Peter said, well, this can't happen. And so Peter, in response to this thing, he actually knows they are teaching. And we're going to go through this in 2 Peter. They're saying different things about Jesus' identity, his purpose, his vocation, what believers have to go through, that there's an easier way out, that you can be half in, half. They're saying all this stuff that we're going to go through, some of it, although the heresy is implied, not necessarily stated, because Peter is going to go on and attack the teachers themselves and their motivation. And so what Peter does, he writes his last letter to the church. And what this means is simply this. All the letters we have in the New Testament were apostles. They were writing, and these letters would go to where believers met in homes. And they would read them, and then they would sing. They would devote themselves to teaching the apostles through these letters. They would sing, then they would have the Lord's Supper, and then they would talk about needs, and they would meet needs within the church. This was the big thing they were being killed for. But he writes a letter to be read. This is a second, we call it. Coincidentally enough, since Peter wrote it, Second Peter. He writes his last letter, reminding them to remember everything he had taught them. And in the middle of this, he writes this, 2 Peter 1, 16 through 19. For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord. That's probably not really a picture of him, by the way. The, just letting some of you know, right? The power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard his utterance made from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. Okay, simply this. There was a time in the ministry where Jesus said, hey, Peter, James, John, come with me. And they go up on a hill. They walk up this hill. And when they're up there and amazing things happens to them, there's this what's called the transfiguration. And, and they see Elijah and Moses basically ministering to Jesus. And they're just crazy. They're going, we'll talk about this later, but I have to hit it now because it's in here. It's a context. And, and they see this thing. And then an utterance from heaven, God's voice says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And, and this is what Peter's referring to. He goes, man, we saw everything. We heard this. Hard to argue with what we saw. This is what he is, he's saying. We saw it. We didn't make it up. Christ taught us everything I've given you. In fact, Paul, he wrote that you could actually go ask people. He said, if you don't believe me, go back and ask some of these people who were in Jerusalem who saw the same events. Which makes sense, doesn't it? Because, and this is now where we're going to get to history. We're going to get to history because obviously I didn't take English. We're going to. 
If it were real, if these events were real, then history would have some accounts of it. Can we agree with that? Now, I need to make a case because some people don't understand how history works, and I'll make it this way. I don't mean to, br- I'll talk to my fellow football coaches. I, I don't mean to brag, but I do hold a state football playoff record. I do. I, it's never been beat since 1984, 83 actually. I, I did it. Probably going to stand until the end of time. It is one of those, all, I'm serious, it's one of those, it's an amazing record. I hold the uh, state playoff, all, every time football's ever been played in the state of Oregon, every level, I hold the record for the longest fumble return for a touchdown. That's a pretty big deal, isn't it, Josh? I fumbled it. <laughs> I fumbled it into the end zone. Some guy picked it up and ran it back 101 yards. <sighs> Probably not going to be broken. <laughs> it's hard to go more than 101 yards. And we lost the playoff game. Thank you very much. Some of you were there. Some people remember it. Trask, every time I see Trask, he's like, hey, 43, how those hands? I said, thanks, Dave. It's been 40 years. But you know what? It made the papers. It made the new era. It made the Albany Democrat. In fact, because at the time we were ranked pretty high in the state, it made the Oregonian. But you know what it didn't make? It didn't make any national news. It, it didn't. And so we start talking about accounts of Jesus Christ. Some people come up and go, I don't see them mentioned when it talks about Caesar crossing the Rubicon. You fool. Of course not. It didn't make national news. But it would have made local news, wouldn't it? There'd be local accounts of it. We should expect... <laughs> or stop. I don't know. We should expect, if this, these events true, were true, that there should be accounts, local accounts of Jesus, of his existence, of his name, of his claim to be the Messiah, of his ministry gathering followers from Jews and Gentiles. There should be accounts, local accounts, of how the leaders, the local leaders responded to him. There should be accounts of who killed him. There should be accounts of how he died. And I'm going to tell you, as Peter is going to say later, you should be extremely intentional and interested as if there is or isn't. Because you have bet your life on it. See, there's nobody in here who has not bet your life on it. You, you say, well, I don't believe it. You bet your life on it not being true then. You say, well, I believe it. You bet your life on it being true. There should be historical accounts of it. And so we're going to do something that I don't think I ever really say in church, and I hope to not say it too often. We're going to ignore the Bible today. Some of you are like, that's the church I just left, dang it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Just calm down. Yeah, I, uh, I had a question mark on whether or not I should say that. Um, well, I did, though, because we're actually going to do this instead. We're going to not even look at the biblical account. We're going to ask ourselves, what is possible to learn about Jesus, if he even existed, from nothing but historical sources having nothing to do with Christianity. And you would ask yourself, why are we doing this? Let's go back. Peter said in what we're looking at, remember I said we have to follow the text. He said, we did not follow cleverly devised plans of man. I'm a witness to what I saw. What did he see? What does history say about it outside of the Bible? Well, let's start with Nero because he was the one that kind of Peter, the story starts with in many ways that we're looking at. Peter made, or uh, Nero made national news, didn't he? Nero, the emperor Nero, he comes down. We know so much about him. We don't know if he really actually played the fiddle, but I like that. It comes down even now. He played the fiddle while Rome burned. Uh, We don't know. But I can say this. There was a historian named Tacitus, a famous historian uh, that, that people would say. This is a big deal. Named Tacitus. And he was a famous writer. And his last major work was entitled Annals. And he wrote it in 116 AD, only 80 to 85 years after Jesus Christ. And in that, He simply includes what cannot be dismissed, which is a biography of Emperor Nero. That's it. Makes sense, doesn't it? The big guy making national news. And here's the section around Nero's response to the great fire of Rome in 64 AD. It's going to be a while. Those of you who hate history class, I always say it's because you had a horrible history teacher. History's amazing. So here we go. This is the account... 
of Tacitus, just talking about Nero. Neither human effort nor the emperor's generosity nor the placating of the gods ended the scandalous belief that the fire had been ordered by Nero. Therefore, to put down the rumor, Nero substituted his culprits and punished in the most unusual ways those hated for their shameful acts whom the crowd called Christians. The founder of this name, Christ, Christus in Latin, that's, he didn't write that, had been executed in the reign of Tiberius by the procurator Pontius Pilate. And this is amazing. This superstition, suppressed for a time, but 40 days, the deadly superstition erupted again, not only in Judea, the origin of this evil, but also in the city, Rome. Is that it, Joseph? So what do we know? We're not even in the Bible. We know that Jesus was referred to as Christus, Christ. Do I not have that, Joseph? I'll just go through and if whatever you got, you got. You do or don't? What do we know? Nero, excuse me, Jesus was referred to as Christus, the Messiah, the Greek word. It was common. Now the person who was writing this, Tacitus, he wasn't saying he was the Messiah. He didn't know anything about this faith. He wasn't locally aware of this, what they knew. No more so than you know the ins and outs of a faith that is not your own. But he knew that this person had been called Christ so much that that must be his name. The same as you think that Jesus' last name is Christ. Jesus Christ. It wasn't. Yeshua ben Yosef, the Christ. What do we know? We know that the Christ, the Messiah, was a distinctive way which his followers referred to him. What else do we know? We know that Christ was associated with the beginning of a movement that followed him bearing his name. What else do we know? Just from this. And I only chose two today. Do you know there are hundreds and hundreds of historical documents just like this? Not all saying the same thing, but all bringing into account the fullness of the biblical account. We know that he was executed by the Roman governor of Judea during the reign of Tiberius. And this guy's name was Pontius Pilate. Pretty accurate. The Bible story, isn't it? Why do you believe in Jesus? Well, you just got to believe the Bible. A Roman historian writing a biography of Nero testifies to Jesus and supports Peter's claims. And then he says this, and the faith died for a moment, and then it exploded. The question always has to be asked, which historians cannot 100% answer. What happened? What happened? But is there more? Is there more, he asks. And the answer, of course, is... Come on. Is there more? Yes. yes. <laughs> you guys. Josephus, one of the most famous ancient historians and an opponent of the faith, hated Christians, hated them. He identified as a Roman individual, but he was Jewish. On both counts, he hated this new faith, hated it, was not a supporter. He wrote a book called Antiquities, one of the most famous ancient books of all times. And there are actually two mentions of Jesus in his book. Here's the first one. It's kind of interesting. Being therefore this kind of person, i.e. a heartless Sadducee, Ananus, so he's talking about this guy. Is he talking about Jesus at all? No, he's talking about this Sadducee in the region, thinking that he had a favorable opportunity because Festus, Festus, had died and Albinus was still on his way. We don't understand this. We don't care. Go to the next thing. Called the meeting, literally, the Sanhedrin of judges and brought into it the brother of Jesus. Now, how common was the name Yahushua, Joshua, Jesus? How common was it? Very common. Extremely common. So much so that he's not talking about Jesus. He's trying to identify which Jesus would have been brought in. So he says, Jesus, who is called Messiah, his brother, he called in James by name. Interesting thing, James is actually Jacob. Don't get confused. Let's go back to James. 
I just, whatever. James, he made the accusation that they had transgressed the law and he handed them over to be stoned. What do we know? We know that they called James, who was the brother of Jesus, who claimed to be the Messiah. Pretty cool, right? Second thing he talked about in antiquities. Look at this one. This is called the Testimonium Flavius. This is cool. This is cool. Around this time, there lived Jesus, a wise man. And here's something that you need to understand. There's two versions of this, and this is the teacher me coming out. One of them that you will read has been edited by Christians later. One of them says some things that are obviously not by Josephus. Things that says, if he could indeed be called a man, he was indeed the Messiah. And I've heard pastors quote that. They, that is, there's no scholarly, somebody later inserted that. Can we use our brains? You were called to love the Lord our God with all of our, and our, right. Got to use our brains. This is the original oldest. Around this time, Josephus said, there lived Jesus, a wise man, for he was one who died, did surprising deeds, and a teacher of such people as accepted the truth gladly. Now hold on. Gladly means pleasurably. He's saying pervertedly. Not gladly, like, oh, this is good. He goes, and these people accepted this perversion. Okay, Joseph. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks when Pilate, upon hearing him, accused by men of the highest standing among us, had condemned him to be crucified. Those who in the first place came to love him did not give up their affection for him. And the tribe of Christians, so-called after him, have still to this day not died out. He hated the Christian faith. What can we know about this? Another historian, an opponent of Christianity, he mentions Jesus, he mentions James, and then he says something very interesting, the same thing, the same thing that Tacitus had to include if they were going to be accurate. Hate them, not hate them, they had to say this, despite killing Jesus, the movement exploded, starting in Jerusalem, he says, and then spreading to Rome. I'll ask you again, what happened? So we only looked at two historians, and those of you who still hate history, says something about me. I'm not going to look at more. I am going to say this, though. What have we learned about Jesus today by simply looking at two, two historical accounts and never opening our Bible? Well, let's look at it. Slides. We're going to bust through them. Here's what we've learned, class. He existed as a man. Just keep busting through them. His peer, his personal name was Yahoshua Jesus. He was called Christos in Greek, the Messiah. He had a brother named James. He won over both Jews and Greeks. Jewish leaders of the day expressed unfavorable opinions about him. Pilate rendered the decision that he should be executed. His execution was specifically by crucifixion. What's the next one? Perfect. Did you realize all that could be found out without ever opening your Bible? Did you realize that every time that, that you said something like, I believe because I just believe, you were actually diminishing the historical, the actual truth of who Jesus the Christ really was? That we are called to know, to at all times defend the reason for our hope, Peter said. At all times, be prepared. My hope does not simply go because I feel sincerely good about something. And I'll say at the end, my doubts, and I'll speak it at the end, at 2 a.m. when I'm just like you and I wonder, do I have it right? This is what I fall back on. And we're going to talk about that. It's this. We know all these things. And then again, we know that the faith grew. The faith grew. What happened? The greatest man did what it did best. In fact, what it did all the time. It all the time killed leaders of a movement it viewed as a threat. This was common. You guys realize that, do you not? 
Anytime the Romans thought somebody might cause problems, in fact, do you, do you know that there were multiple instances of other people claiming to be the Messiah and having followings in Judea? Do you know what you can do today? Go visit where they were killed and go visit the graves that are marked. And you know what happened to every movement that they claimed to be starting after their leader died? They died with them. Same thing. Who was the guy and claiming to be Jesus down in Waco? Yeah, it doesn't make much of a difference to us now because guess what? He wasn't. And his movement died. And I'm not making any case to be anything other than factual. It died with him, as did theirs. This is what they did all the time. And yet a few days later, both historians say that this movement exploded. It couldn't be kept down. A spark ignited. Tacitus and Josephus both said it exploded. And here's what's important. We're not even looking at scripture today. Where did it explode? Where did it start? In Jerusalem. The very place that this leader was publicly executed according to all historical accounts. Something happened because of that right there, right in the shadow of the hill where they had went and seen him die is where the movement took off. And it exploded in the very city where everyone saw him crucified. It exploded because people, by the thousands, ran to visit the grave when it was called empty. See, we don't think of that. This was the Passover. A city of 70,000 people with pilgrims had over 300,000 people in it. Jesus was a rock star. Read your Bible. Everybody wanted to see the magic man do the tricks, did they not? They wanted to see the miracles. Then they hated him so much, it was great to see him killed. And then, three days later, the tomb was empty. Do you think it just stayed? No foot traffic? People were running to see it. People were running, and they're talking about everything. It exploded. Nobody says there was no body. There is not a single historical account that says the body was anywhere but gone from the tomb. No one had it, so people were running to see it. It exploded because they ran to visit a tomb which was empty. A historical fact, the tomb was empty. Rome does not lose their bodies. It exploded because people claimed to see Jesus alive in Jerusalem. Crazy. Historical facts following perfectly the biblical account. And then it took off, man. About 40 days after that, it took off. Now we go to Peter, who everything in Scripture, every apostle, has shown everything I've said up to this point is true. You can check with Tacitus. You can check with Josephus. You can check with everybody who saw it. Everything that I say happened, happened. And what they don't know when they say, and then it exploded, was this. This is what happened. Peter, central to the story, says they were sitting in an upper room one day, weren't they? That Jesus had said, stay in Jerusalem, I'm sending somebody. I'm sending somebody. And like, what could be better than you? And Jesus with a smile goes, this is going to be great. And he ascends to the Father, and they're waiting, and suddenly it sounds like a rushing wind. It just fills the space, and they look at each other, and a fire enters all of them because God returned to his people to indwell forever. And so Peter says, this is what happened. When they said it died for a while, 40 days or so, and then exploded, what you don't know is the backstory. This happened, and we couldn't contain it, and we ran out into the streets, and we began to teach more than a month of people rushing to an empty tomb. More than a month of these thousands of people there for the Passover, hearing stuff, seeing for themselves. He's alive. He's walking around. More than a month of Rome looking. More than a month. Now they rush out into the streets. And the spark, the real fire that Rome could have blamed us on, is the spark of the Holy Spirit that set this fire that continues in the church today. It came hard, people. 
the spark that set it free were actually, think of this, the words which Peter said that day. He came out into the crowd. And those of you at, at the, uh, other, the, the young adult life group, you're studying Acts, you know this. Peter goes out and they're asking him what's going on. And Peter said to the thousands of people who are listening, he says this, the first message given, he said, this Jesus whom you crucified, God has raised up and we, and he does this, are all witnesses. Not we are witnesses. He says you saw it. You killed him and you've seen him walking around and you've seen the empty tomb. And they yelled back. They know it. They go, what are we to do? This is historical. What do we do? He goes, you better repent and get right. And over 3,000 of them that day said what? We got to do this because they had no argument to the historical facts that they had seen. Jesus was real. He was crucified. Historians say, we don't know what happened, but then it took off. Peter says, let me give you the behind-the-scenes director's cut. This is what happened. And those thousands of people, they left their region. They were pilgrims. They left Jerusalem to return to their regions, and they took their faith with them. Shortly thereafter, followed by the apostles who took their faith with them. This is true. If you don't know this, this is important, is it not? This is a big deal. We're not even in Scripture. How outside of the Bible? I just believe. I just believe it enough. It must be true. And they believed because they were indeed witnesses to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They believed because as Tacitus and Josephus wrote, it was historical. And the movement took off. Now, Peter... Imprisoned, awaiting death, he says, I was there for all of it. Now we're back to Second Peter. And people are coming and telling you something different. People are coming and telling you that, that you don't have to listen to us. People are telling you that there's a different way than we have taught. He says, do not listen to them. He was there when Jesus asked him and James and John to climb up a hill. He was there when he saw Moses and Elijah appear and minister to Jesus. He was awestruck as the voice of God spoke out of all space and time and said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. He was indeed a witness. And he is saying this. He says, and I am a witness as all the promises and prophecies of God were fulfilled in Christ. And so he writes this. Second Peter, end of it. One, I believe, is it 19? So we have the prophetic word made more sure. My goal today as your pastor, and today whether you join our little membership, which there's a whole uh, training we do, and there's a hundred dollar entry. No, we don't need that, right? <laughs> whether you say this is where you go every week because you claim family, or whether this is your first time today, you're listening to me. I am your pastor today. And I can tell you my whole goal today was to make you all the more sure of your faith. To understand that the prophetic word can be made more sure to which you do well to pay attention to. Amen, amen. As to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your heart. You would do well to pay attention, Peter says. Peter says you would do well to pay attention to the surety of what he has taught them and through his writings he has taught us to focus upon the light that has entered the world that drives out all darkness and this is the point he's making because he's writing specifically as you would write to a child caught far away in some decisions they've made, caught in the throes of addiction and decisions that have come up. You would write to them speaking as a father. You would write as a spiritual heart to them saying, this is where you're at and here is the truth. He is saying, writing to them in the terms of there are people saying different things. He is saying the light that will drive out all this darkness of what other people are saying is the light of Jesus Christ of which I am a witness to. Everything I have said, the darkness comes about in some very strange ways. It comes about through people claiming, people in the church. There's something different. There's something new. There's something novel. It's about you. It's not about you. That somehow there's something more that you should be able to do or something you must do to get into Jesus' favor. No, he says, focus on the light of what we have shared with you. The absolute prophetic truth of the word. And who is the word? Christ. He says, do that. 
Not new. It's not novel. He said last week. Well, he didn't say last week. He said 2,000 years ago. But last week we looked and he says, I'm not telling you something you don't know. One of the main things a false teacher within the church will always try to tell you is, I got this new thing. Do this. Feathers, angel dust, gold on the floor. Oh, well, I am. Would you leave me alone for a second? <laughs> Abby, you loved that one, didn't you? Listen. They're always going to say there's something new. The darkness comes in. He says the claims that what we saw wasn't true. Teachers claiming there's another way. There's another interpretation. Darkness within the church. Even your doubts, he says. I'm going to get into that. Even your doubts. Did it really happen? Is it really true? Peter reminds us that he saw it. He was an eyewitness. But I want to say today, so was Tacitus. So was Josephus. History itself is witness to the person, the surety, the identity of Jesus Christ. And I'll end with this. But what about his resurrection? Well, Tacitus and Josephus and thousands of other scholars are witnesses just to this. Something happened. Something happened. They fall short of giving testimony to the fact that Jesus was up and walking around. But we do know that the empty tomb was a spark. And I would say things like this if this were the Easter message, but it's not. But I'll give you teasers. I would say things like um, the fact that women found the tomb is, would have been like truth to it because they couldn't even have a witness. The fact that there's no bones to a body. But more than that, I would say this. If you were Rome and you wanted to squash this uprising that was happening and you had the body, what would you have done? You would have produced the body. They didn't have it. Things like this, people go, well, the disciples had the body. You know what? Um, that's not being sincerely wrong. That is lying and being flayed alive, being skinned, being crucified, dying in the way that they died and simply saying, send me to Jesus, is not the response of someone who is living a lie. And they weren't getting rich off this thing anyway. Look at the cults of men. Michelle and I always laugh when we're watching a documentary and it says something. And then this man, he started this faith, this religion, and everybody lived together. I'm like, wait for it. And they're like, oh, and then, and then he got rich because he demanded their money. He said, oh, that's one. Wait for it. And he slept with all the women. There it is. Yeah. It's always about making profit centers, and you cannot find that in Scripture of any of these, nor the biblical and extra biblical accounts. They saw something. They saw it. Peter, whose accounts are paralleled exactly by that of the historians, he feel, fills in the blank. And I need to tell you today, the only plausible fashion to account for the explosion of Christianity in the very same city in which Christ was publicly crucified is the fact that Jesus was seen publicly alive. And some of you are going to say, I don't believe that. That's simply based upon not historical faith, but a faith in your own belief, which is men do not come back from life. And I will agree with you. Men do not. Which leaves you today with something you should pay very special attention to no matter how you came into this building today. The only explanation we are left with, history says, is that Jesus Christ was exactly who he claimed to be. Yeah. That's it. You see, that's it. And I would say, if you're in here today and you're saying, I don't believe this stuff, you've made a choice that your life depends upon because you still are not on a truth quest, you're on a happiness quest, and already in your mind you're counting the cost, and you are saying, I know this, i got to give this up, give this up. I am not saying anything about what you must give up. I am saying what you could receive. Yeah. We always want to make this equal. Well, you need to stop sleeping with this. You need to stop smoking on that. You need to stop saying this and drinking that. I have said none of that. I'm saying you have an offer to receive exactly who he said he was. The Messiah who has come to offer life and freedom and every good thing. And if you continue to weigh these options, it's because you are counting the cost as you should. But at the end of the day, you're betting your life on a pursuit of your happiness and not on truth. And I know it's a stretch. I believe that Jesus intentionally left some of this for us to have to follow through faith. But I can tell you that our faith goes beyond reason. I get it. We get the resurrection and we go beyond reason. My point, and I put it on your not a bulletin. I discovered this past week after my wife and I had an argument over the not a bulletin. We had a fight over it. Well, I said it can't be a bulletin because I hate bulletins. Blah, blah, blah. My wife is so passive aggressive. She did something I didn't even notice. She put on there. Are they on there again this week? 
Somewhere hidden on there it says, not a bulletin. <laughs> Didn't even know about it. Yeah, now you guys know what I live with. You are such a blessed man. Peter, yeah. <laughs> I don't even know what I was talking about at this point. But the whole point of it is this. Oh, that's what I put on there. Our faith goes beyond reason, but as history attests to, our faith never goes against reason. Never. It is based on historical facts. So, what do you do with it? Last thing I want to say is, I have my doubts. Is it okay for your pastor to say that? I wake up at 2 a.m. in the morning and I have friends who are sincerely down their path sincerely following their faith, sincerely following no faith. They talk about things as if all paths lead to God. They talk about even within the church, like I've said, things about experiences being more important than facts. Things about, the, you know, again, I know people, they lay on graves and they soak up what's left of dead people's Holy Spirit. The grave soaking. And these are people who write many of the songs that are being sung. This is just truth. Is this not true? Am I lying? And I realize that these things are very appealing. And I sit there and I go, man, every Sunday I lose people who want me to say things like, you go do you, boo, right? And I'm not saying that. I'm saying Jesus Christ is the greatest gift you could possibly ever receive. And these claims he makes are based on history. And yet I go to bed and at 2 a.m. in the morning, I'm like, who am I to say? When the world begins to whisper, I might be wrong. So this is what I wanted to put. This is the last slide. The facts of our faith are the foundation we stand upon when the world whispers to our ears. You see, when I simply say, I believe, and somebody else goes, well, I believe, how do I argue truth? And our truth is not fluid as we're told today. Truth is not obtuse. It's not abstract. Truth is concrete. Truth is grounded. I see people all the time going, well, I like to question. The fact that there's a question implies there must therefore be an... We got it. Not because I believe it, but because the historical facts testify to it. And then yes, that fire that ignited the church resides within me and resides within you and it testifies to my spirit. But at 2 a.m. sometimes he's quiet. And I hold on to the fact of this. Mine is, and I'll tell you guys, we're done, I guess. Mine is, where's the body? It all comes back to that for me when I can't figure it out. When people say things like, well, do you believe the Old Testament? I said, Jesus quoted it. I got to... He quoted it. Do you believe this? I believe that Jesus Christ was who he was. Why? Because there's no body. Because of the things that have happened. Because you and I are still here today, even though Rome, 2,000 years ago, tried to squash this religion that had no resources, that had no power, that had no resiliency other than they had God on their side. And we testify as historical facts to the veracity of our faith. Next time you're asked by somebody, why do you believe? You say, because I could not. All of history testifies that our faith is real. Be prepared to share it. But even more than that, believe it today as you leave. That's not a burden for us, but it's freedom for us. In Jesus' name, amen. And that's my prayer.